President Trump's economic policies. In a recent Fox News poll, 63% of Americans say that they are optimistic about the U.S. economy. Joining us right now is the CEO of Deloitte, Kathy Engelbert. Kathy, it's good to see you this morning. Great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. So we heard from the public, your big customers are business, and we want to hear what business is saying in terms of the economic policies. What's most important? What are businesses focusing on the, the, these days? Maria, I think one of the things businesses are focused on are the skills mismatch. There's 7.3 million jobs available, and, and businesses, can, if they want to have a growth agenda, they can't find a way to get the employees in to match to the skills they need. So that's one of the focus. They're obviously focused on a lot of other things, cyber and privacy and, um, you know, digital and transformation, but they're focused on this job skills mismatch. Yeah, part of the thing is that, it doesn't it go back to education? I mean, I, I'm just astounded that in this whole conversation that we have every day about policy from health care to tax policy, immigration, we don't hear education. And, and you know, you, our, our people are under attack from China, from AI, technology, putting them out of the business. I mean, who's training our people to thrive in this new era? Well, that's the issue. So we do have a lot of college graduates, high school graduates, but do they have ready skills for what corporate America, at least, is looking for or in the So the onus economy? is on companies? So the onus is on, I think, public-private partnerships. I think there is a lot of work being done around that. I know the Business Roundtable has a whole workforce and education development system going where we're loading up skills and then trying to match them. But it is going to, I think the burden will fall on companies to do the training uh, and to get the, the people in the door and train them as to what they want them to do because the skills, the half-life of skills is changing so much quicker than it did 10, 20 years ago. It seems like a lot of businesses are forming uh, partnerships with local community colleges, for example, and I would think that's really a benefit to both both sides of that equation, right? I mean, it probably makes sure that the community colleges are fulfilling their role of preparing these kids, but it also is sort of a pipeline into the companies. Actually, absolutely, and, and it helps with the diversity uh, and agenda as well for many of these companies who are trying to get diverse candidates in. The community colleges have amazing diversity. The workforce obviously is diverse yeah. today. Um, but back to the skills, uh, I think whether it's community colleges or four-year colleges or even out of high school, the skills mismatches, has that gap has has got to be filled, and that's what we're working very hard to do. Kathy, I'm really glad. Uh, I really want to ask this question to like the highest level tax person I could think of, <laughs> and that would be you. Um, and okay, every day we get a new proposal to soak the rich, right? And they all, broadly speaking, fall under the categories of a wealth tax, some sort of income tax, or a cap gains tax. Various billionaires who are for them have waited. Even Bill Gates said, "Well, he favors cap gains." Knowing what goes on at the very highest level of taxation. If some one of these candidates wins and you are advising them, okay, this is the best way to do the least damage to the economy and get the most money out of the super rich, which way would you go? Well, it depends on what your ultimate objective is. So obviously, in the current administration, it was tax cuts to drive economic growth, GDP growth to where we think as America, when we're trying to compete with places like China, where the, their, GDP, or their GDP growth outpaces ours. So it depends on what platform you're looking for. So obviously, there are some that are looking for that platform that is uh, particularly um, taxing on the rich or, or whatever. So I, I think I would give advice that if you want economic growth and you want jobs and you want to, you know, help with the skills mismatch, that we're going to have to fund some of these programs and we're going to have to get U.S. business to help do that with government. And the only way to do that is not to necessarily overtax yeah, U.S. Yeah, stop business. dreaming about trillion-dollar-plus federal programs that, that are going to put the economy in, in the ditch. How's that? Yeah, because the, fun, the funding element will always be your, your quagmire. That, that, and that goes to, well, the, the root of the, the thinking is that government knows best and politicians know better than you do, whether it's about your health or about your money. They think they're better at spending it and, yeah, better, at, gonna, and, ma and better at managing your health care. The moral, I mean, we know it's politi it morally questionable, but assuming they win and, they, and they, they're trying to not destroy the economy and make it Venezuela, what's the <laughs> Next, what's the best way to give everyone the cathartic experience of soaking the rich without destroying the economy in the process? She, Kathy's not going to answer yeah, that yeah. question. Yeah, no. I mean, any, way, any way you cut it, if you're talking about raising taxes. I didn't ask people. you the question. Oh. Well, but with everything, there's a, there's a, there's a, with everything, there's a balance. I mean, consumers still rule. Yeah. And as you think about how the consumers would feel about that, ultimately, if, if you know, taxes go up, jobs start to get cut, 
obviously we're, we're you know, looking for growth. Everyone has a growth agenda. They're looking at their um, disruption that's disrupting their business models, and they're looking at how to get the next growth. And, and one way not to do that is, is to have that type of tax policy. One, one of the things you mentioned earlier was cybersecurity and how that is a big issue for corporations, obviously. What, what is happening on that front? Because it seemed to me five years ago, two years ago, American companies were really behind in terms of establishing their defenses. Are we even close to being protected on most of these companies? Doesn't seem like it. Yeah, I think when you look at the financial services industry, they have spent a lot of yeah. money, a lot of investment, and they've really moved the needle. I think other companies in other industries are catching up. I think there's a lot of capital being spent in this area. There's a lot of burgeoning businesses coming out of this, obviously with the cloud and the, the uh, mobility and 5G <laughs> coming on board. All of this is going to be. But the privacy mm. thing, everyone talks cyber. The privacy thing is rising. Oh, yeah. The, rise of the millennial and digital native on social media and the rise of employee activism, something I never thought I'd be spending so much time yeah. on, and making sure our employees feel heard well, inside keep, the company rather than going outside We, the we keep finding so, hidden cameras everywhere. I mean, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> That's right. Uh, how about women empowerment? The White House launched this Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative uh, this week, led by Ivanka Trump. You were one of the roundtable participants. How was that? Tell us about it. Yeah, so the nice thing about that, one, it's global, and two, it's bipartisan. So it's one of those rare occasions when you can go to the White House and have something very bipartisan. And if you look at it, there's 130 million girls out of school. If that were a country, it'd be the 10th largest, the size of both the UK and France together. Wow. Um, there is, um, while, while over the past 30 years, we've added half a billion women to the workforce, the actually participation of uh, rate of women has declined from about 51 to 48 percent during that period. So there's a lot more we can do. The barriers are well documented. The benefits are well documented. It could add $12 trillion to uh, the global economy. So this is about funding programs. So starting with USAID, a $50 million grant, uh, uh, pr pr private companies have come forth, UPS, Pepsi, you know, ourselves and others to, to fund some of these, uh, really to get the access to education. I mean, to have a, all these women out of work around the world where there's different cultures around the world, Dagan, right? So it's really a, a, a challenge. and. Um, at the current pace, I think to get gender equality in, in, from an economic empowerment, it would take over 200 years at the current pace. Oh, my God. I can't believe we're still talking about gender equality. I mean, we should be a lot farther along that this wouldn't be such an issue, but it still is. Yeah, well, and, and you have, incredible. And you have countries like Afghanistan where you may go well, backwards, yeah. unfortunately. I mean, you know, these gains are hard fought and they're also easy to lose if, if the political will isn't there. Right, but you, but the U.S. investment in some of these countries has made a big impact, and you see women from Africa, women from Asia, who will come to the U.S. and say thank you to the U.S. taxpayers because your dollars are being used to really make an impact, whether it's in rural communities, um, giving connectivity, whatever the issue is. So I, I think we are making progress, Maria. Yeah. I think the U.S. is probably ahead with uh, our women's economic empowerment and a lot of what's being done on venture capital. All so. right, I'll pay for that. Kathy, good to see you. <laughs> Great to Thanks see so you. Thanks so much. Thank Kathy Engelberg from Deloitte.